We're very thankful to have another opportunity to come to Friendship Missionary Baptist Church and to have this opportunity to stand for the Lord. And we thank the Lord for this opportunity and thank you for your prayers. And we certainly hope and pray that this will this word of the Lord's will uh, be directed by the Holy Spirit of God. I believe that's how it needs to be. Is it's not me, it's the Lord. Uh, it's His Word and His Spirit, and I pray that it will find its way into the heart that it needs to find into and uh, word that needs to be spread. We're going to look this evening in the book of Matthew in the 13th chapter uh, for a reading lesson starting at verse 24. Matthew 13 and 24. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye for, together first the tares, and bind them in bundles uh, to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, with my mistakes in reading, that's verses 24 through 30 of this 13th chapter of Matthew for a reading lesson. And we find here that the Lord obviously, he would speak in parables a, a lot of times to uh, pick a natural thing to explain a spiritual uh, picture. And you can read on, and we may, we'll make reference to it on down in this chapter of how he explained this parable. But as we see here that the uh, Lord is explaining to them about how that there was a field sown, and the scriptures say here that this field is the world, and how that those that were of the good seed, uh, this wheat that sprung forth, the scriptures say that these are the children of the kingdom, that the tares, these that sprung up later, were sown by the wicked one, that enemy that he spoke of was the devil, Satan himself, and how that at the end when they, uh, uh, the reapers were sent to gather, it says that the reapers are the angels and the angels are going to bind together those tares or those wicked ones and they will be thrown into the fire and those that are saved will be gathered uh, together unto the barn which is talking there about heaven. We find and we look and consider these thoughts here tonight uh, uh, that while men slept, the enemy came and he sowed these tares among the wheat uh, and he went on his way. Now the thing that I have uh, tried to do in studying in, in, in this uh, uh, lesson is to distinguish early on how quick can you tell the difference between a wheat and a tax. Uh, how long does it take to be able to see a very noticeable difference between these two? The scriptures here said that the blade sprung up and it brought forth fruit. So it really takes to a longer period of time uh, that when that wheat comes and it brings forth its fruit, those kernels at the end of that, uh, that is the fruit thereof that is used, uh, uh, the, the fruit there of that wheat used in flour and bread, and you just name the different things that it can be used for. Uh, it, it's fruitful in that it has a purpose. But it is not until it gets to that point that you see that then they could tell the difference between these wheat and these tares, that there was a distinguishable difference between those that bore fruit and those that did not. I am firm to believe today that there is a difference between those that are the children of God that are here in the world today that have a true testimony of salvation. You might say to yourself, 
Who are you to determine what is true? The Bible teaches us what a true testimony of salvation is. I find in the scriptures there is uh, uh, John was preaching there in the uh, wilderness and he come down there and he's telling them to repent the kingdom of heaven's hand. He was baptizing those that had uh, a uh, testimony. These Pharisees and Sadducees come. He saw them coming and, and they were pious. They were religious. They were devout within their set of rules that they wanted to be devout to. But they didn't mix that with faith. And here John recognized them by their uh, outward appearance and by their nature, by their speech. And he said, who's warned you to come, you old generation of vipers? Who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? He said, bring forth therefore fruits, meat or fitting or proper for repentance. The product of godly sorrow, the product of a broken heart, the product of a contrite spirit, bring forth fruit. Because an individual that is realized that they're lost and separated from God, when they have had true godly sorrow upon that soul, they have been broken down. They see that they can't trust in anything else, even their own selves, and they put their entire faith in the Lord. I want you to understand there is a time and place where that individual is born again and they have fruit to bring forth. They have something that they can bear. But I want you to understand that there are people in this world, this world today, a religious world today. Now, I didn't say a Christian world. People use that word Christian pretty loosely. I'm talking about saved people. People's got a time and place they've been saved. There's a lot of people that wear the name Christian. There's a lot of people that say they're a member of a church or that they believe in a spirit or that they believe there's a God that don't have a time and a place where the Lord saved their soul. They have a desire to look like the wheat. They have a desire to appear as though that they are the same but I want you to understand that somebody that has never been saved by the grace of God has no true fruit to bear in the name of Jesus. We want you to understand that there's going to be people one of these days that's going to stand before the Lord. Uh, you can find this. I've referenced it before because it's very true. Over in the book of uh, uh, Matthew, the seventh chapter, No, not everyone saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There are going to be a day and a time that an individual is going to stand before God Almighty when this life is over, when your life is over, and you're going to say, but Lord, I went to church every Sunday. Lord, I've done these things in your name. But when the Lord looks at you, if you've never been saved by the grace of God, you're dependent on something you've done, dependent on what somebody else told you. He's going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. That word never there means not at any time. I want you to understand here, you might appear like the wheat. You might dress like the wheat. You might have a nice uh, a home or, or a dress nice clothes. You might sing hymnals. You might wave your hands. You might teach Sunday school. But I want you to know, if you ain't never been saved, then God knows what you are. He already can see that you're a tear. And I won't talk about these tares for just a minute. The wheat bears forth fruit. I find what the tear says. It early, it's hard to distinguish. I wrote this down until the wheat has headed out or that it has been brought forth its fruit. And then you can tell the difference. You get to talk to somebody about being a Christian, being saved by the grace of God. And they'll say, well, I'm a Christian and I go to church and I've been baptized and I've this and I've that. And then you ask them, where did the Lord save you? 
and they have nothing to tell you. I want you to know that if an individual ain't been born again for the Spirit of God, they're just like these tares. The difference will finally show. It'll show in this life, and it'll show when you stand before God. You will might mingle in. You might come to a missionary Baptist church. You might think, I'll just come in. I'll, I'll join you. I'll tell you something good enough for y'all to think I've been saved. I'll join the church. Even though you ain't really joined anything if you ain't been saved. Take you down, dunk you under the water, go around to handshake, go to church every Sunday. If you ain't never been saved, God sees your heart. He knows there's no true fruit there. You can mingle in. You can try to fit in. But as far as the Lord is concerned, you stick out like a sore thumb. He sees you don't belong. And you might try to just fit in, but I'm going to tell you what, you won't never fit in. You'll never feel right. You'll never feel right among God's people when they get to shout the praises of God. When the Spirit is there and they begin to sing those old gospel songs, and they are singing them with the Spirit and love in their heart, you'll know you don't belong. You'll know you don't have what they have. You'll know that there's something different between you and them. I'll tell you another bad thing about these tares. It don't bring forth anything. In fact, it's hollow. Hollow. Nothing there. Nothing on the inside. And that's I'm going to tell you what you are on the inside when you're lost and separated from God. You are dark on the inside. You're sinful on the inside. You're uh, separated on the inside from God Almighty. There is nothing there. There's nothing that can bring fruit there. There's death there. I want you to understand today that you might go. There might be somebody that listens to this. The Lord just give this to me to say that you try to stand behind a book board. You try to tell other people what they must do to get to heaven. And you don't have a time and place where the Lord saved your soul. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The the blind leaders of the blind both will fall in the ditch. You need to get out from behind that buckboard and get on your knees and ask God to save your soul. Not trusting in yourselves, not trusting in an organization, but trusting in God Almighty. Because we look here and find that you're going to mingle in in big thousands of people. Ah, oh, you might be in front of them. You might sit out in a crowd. You might think I might sincere intent. Ah, oh, I'm sure it is for many people is to do the right thing. They think that they're going to some called church. It's got to be the right thing. They talk about God and Jesus. That's got to be the right thing. But they don't tell you what you need to be to do to be saved. I know someone I love very dearly. Uh, that they thought that they needed to join a church one time. And they took them into a room. And they talked to them about baptism. They never once asked them if they'd ever been saved. Never talked to them. Never even brought it up. Never asked them, was there a time and place? Didn't ask them anything. I want you to understand, they wasn't worried about their soul. They was worried about a number. I'm worried about your soul. I'm worried where you're going to be when this life is over. You might say, you don't know me. I don't have to know you to be worried about your soul. Because I'm going to tell you what, I don't want anybody to die and go to hell. Not the very first person, not the meanest person in this world. I want them to repent and be saved and be in heaven one day after a while. But there's many today. Uh, the devil has sown in this world. He's sown among the righteous people trying to convince them that they've done enough, that they're good enough. I'm going to tell you what, it won't wash. It won't hold water. I'm going to tell you what, he says here in these scriptures that he knows that they're there. He sees that they're there. You might think because the Lord's leaving you alone that you're all right. That maybe you'll slide by. That you'll slip in. There won't be no slipping in with the Lord now. I'm going to tell you what. There might be a few things in this world that slip by people. Might slip by the law. Might be some slick tongue lawyers that find a loophole. You ain't going to find one with the Lord now. If you ain't been saved, you ain't been saved. And he sees what you are. And one of these days, when the Lord comes back in very much reference to this right here, 
much like it says over here in the book of Matthew in the 25th chapter, and in verse 31, it says, And one the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, and then shall he sit them upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from the other, as the shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on the right hand, and the goats on the left. He's going to gather everybody together one day after a while. When he comes back to judge this world, he ain't going to leave anybody out. It doesn't matter what they speak, what language that they are. Every God is going to be gathered together of all nations and tongues. And the scriptures say he's going to separate them just like a shepherd would the sheep from the goats. And he's going to put the sheep on the, uh, uh, the right hand and the goats on the left. I want you to understand. I believe in what the scriptures say here that those that are the goats, they're going to be cast off into everlasting fire and damnation prepared for the devil and his angels. But those on the right side, those that have been saved by the grace of God, they're going to go on to heaven one day. That's what's going to happen. That's, that's what the scriptures so uh, plainly teach. And you might say, well, maybe I'll slip through. Uh, I'm going to tell you what, it ain't going to be no slipping through. There ain't going to be no easing into this. Maybe I can shift sides. Maybe I can do something then. It'll be too late then. It'll be too late to think. I I'll wait and I'll chance it. You're taking a big chance. I find according to scriptures in Psalms. In the first chapter, in verse 3, it says, And he shall be, speaking of those that delight in the law of the Lord, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth his fruit in season. His leaf shall not wither, whether so, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. So there is a difference here. What he's talking about, a tree bringing forth fruit, this bringing forth something, a product of something, planted by the river of uh, uh, here, by the rivers of water, those that delight in the Lord. But it says here in verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Now you might say, now preacher, you don't know me. I don't steal from nobody and I don't lie and I don't curse. I don't run around on my wife. I don't drink. I do. I tithe. I do all these things that I'm supposed to do and I don't do the things uh, that I ain't supposed to do. You don't know nothing about me. You got that right. I don't know nothing about anybody. I, bear, I know me. But I want you to know what the scripture teaches us. People like that, if you have that thought in your mind, you're trying to gain your way to heaven. You're trying to live good enough. You're trying to hold a line that you weigh your goods outweigh your bads. That's, that's the notion. The scriptures teach me that if you break one little bit of the law, you've broke it all. I believe that's in the book of James. So if you have any thought of sin, you've thought any foolishness, you've ever lied, once you broke it, you can't put it back together. And I want you to understand, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a man that walks here on this face of this earth today that is without sin. Not a single individual, the only person that has ever walked this earth without sin is our Lord and Savior. And had he, uh, uh, he wouldn't have had to come had we been able to, but we weren't able to, and you're not able to, that's why he had to come and die. So you want to know, how are you ungodly? You're ungodly because Christ had to die for your sins, and when he has made you aware of that, that separation in your soul, that condemnation, that emptiness, that knowing that if you die, you'll go to hell, I want you to understand, you are what you are, which is ungodly. I don't say that in pleasure. I'm telling you, trying to help you. The scriptures say there to him at one point, uh, he said that these are sown by the wicked one. That was what was in the scripture there in the reading lesson and in the explanation of it, that wicked one being the devil. He says, ye are of your father, the devil. That's what the scriptures say in the book of John in the 8th chapter and 44th verse. Ye are of your father, the devil. Everybody that is lost and separated from God is not a child of God. They are a child that so is sinful and in opposition to God, just like Satan is. They belong to him. 
The only way out of that is to put your heart and your trust all in the Lord. I'm telling you what, I'd be broken hearted if I thought I was dying going to hell. I was, and that's a nine-year-old boy. And if you want to be saved, you're going to have to be broken hearted because the scripture says that all that are in this shape are ungodly. You will not bear fruit. You cannot bear fruit. You say, oh, I've done some good things. You can't bear fruit if you ain't a part of the vine, ain't a part of Jesus Christ. You'll never bear that first fruit. And if you don't bear that first fruit, you'll never buy, bear any others. You might help some people, but you ain't bearing fruit. That's what the Word says. It goes on and says, But are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. What's the chaff? It's talking about wheat. The chaff, it says, are the husks that remain... After being separated from the grain. So here comes wheat up. It's now making reference to just the wheat itself. And that fruit of it. And it says here the ungodly are not that fruit. They are the rest. That when, Ed, when the fruit, the wheat part is separated from that stalk, from that chaff. That, that chaff is worthless. The scripture says that it's worthless or the definition it's worthless. It's light. It's apt to be driven by the wind. It is refuse. The scripture here says that the, uh, like the chaff which the wind driveth away. I looked up that driveth away. And that in the original text means to thrust away with force. So I want you to understand that when they got to uh, uh, reaping in this wheat and separating the wheat from the chaff, they would take it. And they would have threshing floors as it went along. And they would put that wheat down. And they would get some mules or some uh, uh, oxen. And they would hook it up to uh, a, a blank board. And they'd drive that around. They'd walk all over it. And they would be getting that and that weight on it. That trampling of it. Uh, it would begin to separate that wheat uh, from that chaff. And after that had been done, they would go in. And they would begin winnowing it. Now, we know it's basically just separating it, uh, just tossing it in the air. And then that wind would come when they would scoop it up and they would toss it in the air and the kernels, uh, the fruit, it would fall to the ground. But the wind would blow away the chaff. It would separate it. And what would be left is that which is good and the refuse, that which is of no good and of no use. It just blows away in the wind. The scriptures teach me in Matthew uh, in the third chapter as well. In verse 12, the Lord uh, John the Baptist telling them that they had to repent. Says, whose fan is in his hand. That fan was talking about the winnowing fan. And he will thoroughly purge his floor. To purge means to clean. To clean it, to make it pure. He will clean that floor and gather his wheat into the garner or to the barn. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So here we find that the Lord uses these pictures of the wheat being separated from the chaff. And that chaff represents the ungodly. Those that have not been saved. You might try to mingle in. You might try to appear as though you're all right. But I want you to understand, the Lord knows who you are. He knows where you stand. You can't hide from Him. And one of these days, this world over, from the highest leader to the poorest individual, He's going to, they're all going to stand for God. And I'm going to tell you what, He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. The wheat, that which is weighty, that which is fruit, that can bear fruit of being saved by the grace of God. He'll gather to his barn. He'll take her own home. But that which is not fruit, that which has never been saved, it's going to be bound up just like it said there and cast to that fire. It says an unquenchable fire. Now, I ain't real smart, but you can burn up chaff. You can burn it up. I mean, you can light it a fire, and I don't know how long it'd take to burn some of it. But it'd burn, and it'd burn to nothing, disintegrate. But I believe, according to the Scriptures, that the fire that you're headed towards, where you're going to be cast into, if you do not put your trust in the Lord, is unquenchable not only in the fire itself, but you also will never be burned up. The Scriptures teach me in the book of Mark in the ninth chapter, 
It says here in verse 43, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off, for it is better if thee go through life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter a halt and to lie in life having two feet to be in ha than having two feet and be cast into hell in the fire that shall never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. For it is better for thee uh, to enter into the kingdom of heaven with one eye than having two eyes and to be cast into hell. It says here, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone uh, that uh, shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be which uh, salted uh, with salt. We look here and we find here that it is another comparison to something that we could understand. And you might say, do you want me to take this literal? That I need to cut off my hand, uh, and then that is when the Lord has saved me. Or that I need to cut off one of my feet. And the Lord will save me. Or I need to pluck out one of my eyes. And the Lord would save me. I believe what it's teaching us here. Is if your love for self. Your love for your own self preservation. Outweighs your desire to be saved by the grace of God. You'd be better off to be blind. You'd be better off to be halt. You'd be better off to not be able to pick something up. Than die in that condition. The hole in your body and separated from God in your spirit. The scripture here says, where well, the worm dieth not. The worm is you, the ungodly, the lost and separated from God. I want you to understand, one of these days, you're going to be found out. You might think, it'll, they'll never know. I'll never tell a soul. They won't ever know. I'll testify. I'll tell them of a time and place. Even though you really don't have one. God ain't going to take that. You ain't going to fool him. He has the record. And I'm going to tell you what, it's perfect, son. You ain't got to worry about, does the Lord make a mistake? No, sir, he does not. Well, this ain't going to be. They got these cartoons. They have everybody lined up outside of a gate. Peter's there standing at the gate and he's got this big book. Here stands a big line and they're looking to see is that person's name in that book. Is there something there? They got to figure it out. I'm going to tell you what. Oh, Peter ain't going to be figuring that out. The Lord's done got it figured out. There ain't going to be no line trying to wait in line to see if you in or not. You're going to know. You will know as soon as you see him split that eastern sky one day after a while. You'll know the trouble that you're in. You'll know that you're not prepared. You'll know that you can't hide no more. You'll know that you're down to go to hell. And ain't a thing that can be done at that point in time. It'll be too late. You'll have wished that you had listened. You'll wish that you'd repented. But right now, you're trying to mix in. You're trying to fit in. It doesn't matter. The Lord knows that you're there. Them people that went up to the Capitol... Crawled over in there and broke in and done all that. I don't know what got into them, but they shouldn't have done that, in my opinion. Some of them was covered up just about completely. And I don't know nothing about cameras and all the stuff that they had, but they had some identifying marks on them. They slipped up. They slipped up and they started finding out. And they're still finding out one by one. Who was there? Where are they from? They're locating them. Locating them. Tracking them down. Some found right here in Tennessee. Not far from here. They probably thought nobody will ever know I was here. I'll get away with this. You might think you're going to get away with it from God. But God knows you're here. You might say the world nobody cares about me. If you roll around with a chip on your shoulder about what you don't have. You walk around with that chip on your shoulder and you blame the world and you blame God and you're lost and separated from God, it's going to be a long, hard road to ever get saved. That's the way you go. Because it'd be better for you to have nothing and have the Lord than to have it all. So that's what some people have. They've got it all. They've got so much. They think their wealth makes them righteous. i got news for you. Their wealth does not make them righteous. Their wealth might buy them out of crime, but I'm going to tell you what, or do, uh, pay, uh, uh, buy them out of doing time for their crime, but I'm going to tell you what, it don't buy them nothing with God. 
I want you to understand today, and this is what's been on my heart, is you are not mixed in that God doesn't see you. He sees you. And one of these days, if you don't get down to business, and you, you might say, but my family, you better not worry about your family. It'd be better to go through this life with no family and have a Lord. You might say, but the people I've been raised with, they won't have nothing to do with me. Be better to go through this life without a friend of this world and have Jesus than to live this world with a thousand good friends and none of them be able to do a thing for you. You'd better to have them because one of these days, one of these days, he's going to come back and he's going to separate everybody. He's going to separate those that he saved from those that are lost and those that are lost. He's going to thrust away, thrust them away, thrust them away off from his sight. Me and my family, anybody that's ever heard me, we used to dig potatoes. We had different things, but we had the potatoes. And as a kid growing up, I, I, that was fun to me. I enjoyed it. I loved being out there with my pa, and he'd get in, and that ground, would, he'd stick that plow in, and we'd start digging up potatoes. And we'd have buckets. And you'd get a bucket. Of course, as you got older, the buck, bucket, the beer you bucket got. But then you'd take them and put them in, into bigger bins. And we, they'd be on the wagon. And we was going to take all them to the barn. Wow, them big ones. Boy, look, I got a big one. We would try to take contests. Who's got the biggest one? And Granny, I, I probably said this before. I'd get them little ones. Pa'd say, ah, oh, it ain't big enough. Get rid of it. And Granny said, no, I, I can use that. I'm going to put that in with some green beans. That'll be good. Granny say those little ones was still good. I won't tell you what. The Lord save somebody. It don't matter how little they might look in man's sight. There's something to God. But every now and again, you'd reach down in there. And anybody that ain't never done it, I understand that you can't understand it. You'd reach down in that ground and there'd be a rock one. In the same ground that all them good ones was coming out of, you'd reach in there and that, oh, that slime everything that was on it and you'd grab it and of course as kids we'd say ooh and I'd start rubbing my hand in the dirt to try to get it off and you know what we'd do they'd say throw away and me and my brothers as we was growing up we'd see who could throw them the furthest and the field was off that way no matter what it was we'd rear back we'd fling them just as far as we could I'm going to tell you what one of these days one of these days, the Lord's coming back. He sent his angels to reap this place. And there's going to be some, and that you may be one of them, just as rotten inside as them old potatoes. And let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to be cast off. You ain't going to be took to the barn. You're going to be cast off. You might say, but I was in the same ground. Doesn't matter. Down here, you heard this gospel. You've done nothing about it. You didn't seek the Lord. Say, but I tried. Don't blame the Lord if you ain't been saved. If you ain't been saved, you ain't trusted him, it's on you. It ain't on him. You've trusted in yourself. You've trusted in something. You've doubted him. And let me tell you, when you cast away all doubt, even your own life, put your trust in the Lord, he'll save you just like that. You're talking about fruit. You'll have it right then and there. The first fruit, you'll have it. And you'll know it. And people can know you by your fruit. They, they know when they talk to somebody else, they say, oh, that's one of them old crazy Baptists that believes in heartfelt salvation. I am thankful to be numbered with those people. I am thankful to be saved by the grace of God. And if you're listening, and there ain't no doubt in my mind that somebody is listening to this and will listen to this that knows not the Lord, the Lord has wore me out to preach this. And I want you to know, as weak as I am, he loves you and he's trying to reach out to you to tell you to let go of your ways and put your trust in the Lord. This is our weak effort. May God bless you and I pray to hear one day in glory if I never meet you here. There will be many more there, not because of me, but because of our precious Savior and his precious gospel. Thank you for listening.